goal is to see isolated communities uh, transformed, you know, holistically transformed in, in Christ's name. And we do that by providing access into remote locations and we, we, we partner with the local church or we partner with missions or we partner with education, health service providers, sometimes the government, um, and sometimes we're working directly with the local people. You know, our goal is that by 2045, by which time MAP will be 100 years old, that uh, as far as within our capacity and as far as God allows, that we are able to uh, say that there's no communities that, are, that don't have access to help, hope and healing. That's our tagline. And we work sometimes with, with government too. We A lot of MAP's uh, funding comes from uh, donations from churches and, and small groups, like individuals as well. So how, how long have you been with MAF personally, your family? And... So I've actually had uh, three stints with MAF, one involuntary and two voluntary. Yeah. The involuntary yeah. one was when I was, my parents were with MAF when I was born. Oh, and cool. uh, I was born in Papua New Guinea, yeah. and, but my parents left Papua New Guinea, PNG when I was one. And then um, when my wife and I we were in our mid-20s, we went to Bible school and Bible theological school, Brisbane School of Theology. Mm-hmm. Um, and we then we thought I had to go at, uh, pastoring for a short time. And um, But, yeah, had an interest in aviation well, yeah, ever since I was a kid with the environment that I had been exposed to. And, and we uh, joined MAF ourselves in 19... 19- was it 1997? And then we had five years up in Papua New Guinea, came back to uh, Melbourne and became part of the Croydon Hills Baptist Church. Uh, yeah, it was, it was a prayer of ours when we came back to Australia was that we wouldn't, we wouldn't become too comfortable that we would say these other things are too hard and we won't embrace thought about those activities. And, yeah, and, uh, and uh, we joined MAF again a second time in 2007. Yeah. Um, and the Gordon Hills, that's from, since then that the Gordon Hills Church has been supporting us and that were helpful on that journey into um, joining MAF again and, and since then been very supportive. Mm. Uh, so my role in in uh, Cairns, I'm leading a small team that uh, is looking after strategic development. And so we're looking at uh, future operations of MAF. We're kind of like looking five years ahead and uh, engaging with the, the partners of MAF and, and governments and looking at where are, the, where are the isolated communities that don't have good access um, or who are inaccessible and what would it take to, to get access and, and then try and be preparing for that. It might be building airstrips in remote locations. It might be um, seeking to recruit a team and, and fund for an aircraft and, and set up an operation. It might be working with the government to get approvals. Hmm. Might, the team is on... Uh, Part of us is doing that. We're also looking backwards and doing some some metrics and some measurement uh, of the impact. That's incredible. Like that's for me has given me such a insight into math on a, a much greater level, and particularly mm. uh, the different dynamics and different roles that you've held mm. even in that. Like uh, for, to ask questions into it though, like for you, what what drives you to to do what you do? Why are you part of it? When I um, when I get the privilege to to talk with users of MAF and partners of, of, of MAF, other missions, and hear what their needs are and hear what they're trying to do, and when I can think through how how, how can aircraft and uh, access make a difference to that, it just it's really exciting when that comes off. How do you reflect on the call to mission in generational impact and living to make a difference? Well, I guess the thing that comes to my mind when I, mean, I think of, of generational missions is is really God's faithfulness and, and God's consistency. Um, think of a generational mission as it's incredible that um, God uses his church to, to to deliver his message, to be the to be ambassadors, to be living a story of reconciliation and acting that out and reflecting that in our relationships and, and also in our love for other people. And then facilitating that communication, in, in Matt's case, facilitating that communication by mobilising people and, and providing access to, to isolated communities. What What are some questions that you wish people asked you more? That's a really good question. That's a cool question. Yeah. Um, I I think sometimes the, um, the the figure I mentioned before about like what does it take to 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 run an organization that's involved in in mass ministry because 
I mentioned before about that eight to one ratio between pilots and support staff, and and uh, I think we, I think there's a lot of people could be part of MAF that don't realise they could be because they're oh, I'm not a pilot or I don't know how to fix planes, and and people sometimes don't think beyond that. Uh, also, just perhaps um, curious minds will probably ask questions about what does it take to to um, run an organisation. That's a service mission, but they're not not disempower the people. You know, we're, we're, we're a large organisation. We've got a lot of we've got 120 small aircraft. We're, we're quite large in terms of 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 the resources we have. But then it would be easy. To, it's easy to come into a place and and take over, and or not to take over. That's not quite the right word, but to to actually squash some local innovation and some local um ideas about running because we're kind of like oh we've done this before we know how to do it and and so to ask for people to understand that we and then it's a, it's a helpful question because it's a, a it's a question that causes us to be strategic and and humble in how we approach things and that is how do we how do we do what we're doing bringing in perhaps a tool that's not uh commonly used and, and how do we do that in a way that empowers the local church not just makes Builds dependency, or or um, kind of helps people feel like it's something they can't be part of. I think one of the the beautiful things on that you share is God invites us to be part of a global family. It's not that we're disconnected, but that we're brothers and sisters, and it's like family wherever we go. Uh, so. Here from uh, Steve. Steve is uh, located up in uh, North, uh, not Northern Territory, Cairns, as he said. One of the things that uh, we find exciting here at Croydon Hills is we actually have uh, one of our young men, uh, Sam. When I say young, he's about 20. And he has been um, uh, working up with MAF in the Northern Territory, uh, first of all, for about a year uh, last year. And uh, this year he came back for about six months and he's returned up to a place called Gove up in the Northern Territory and he's helping out on one of their, uh, one of their airfields, coordinating flights, etc. and a whole lot of things, which is really exciting. And it's great to hear kind of those stories. I hope that you find them inspiring as well. I I'm going to invite a couple of other people here who some of you may be familiar with, Pete and Raywin. And Pete and Raywin are part of our church community here. And uh, I think they also have a uh, very interesting story to share as well. Pete and Raywin, welcome. You could give them a round of applause, you know. Can I? <laughs> um, I think what might be a great thing uh, uh, to sort of kick us off is for those who don't really know you, could you tell us what you, what you do? Um, we both work with Wycliffe Australia and SILA Australia and uh, in a variety of roles, a couple of different roles. And a bit of our background, I guess. Uh, we've actually been with Croydon Hills um, since 98. Um, and so uh, this has really be, been our, I guess, our spiritual home for quite a long time. And uh, uh, we met up in Papua New Guinea uh, about 28 years ago. Um, and uh, yeah, we were working uh, in education and in literacy at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. Uh, Raywin, do you want to add to that? Pete's kind of given us a, a little bit of a background. Could you tell us, you said 28 years ago you met in PNG, but I know that there's a bunch of kind of chunks in the middle of that. Could you kind of give us what those chunks are? Um, so before we met, we were, we were both working in Papua New Guinea. I was mm -hmm. um, working at the international school, um, teaching missionary kids and other um, kids in the area. Um, yeah, and then after we went, went back um, working in literacy and... Um, yeah, I was mostly... So, so you're working in literacy from what year? What, what did you just start back in PNG? After we got married. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it would have been 2001 we went back. I, I, I really feel like I should put them in separate rooms and see if we're getting the same <laughs> answer. Don't you feel like that? 2001, and when did you come back to Australia? After that. <laughs> 
Yeah. It's complicated. Per- permanently. I, I know it's complicated. <laughs> I know there's a little bit of toing and froing, yeah, yeah. but mainly yeah. when did you come back and settle in Australia? Um, that would have been 2016. 2016. Fantastic. So for those of you who know, they had three boys while they were away. Your boys now are? Um, <laughs> 20. They've just had birthdays. <laughs> 21, 23 and nearly 25. Okay, fantastic. So, uh, and they're actually a part of our, our church community here, which is fantastic for them to uh, be a part of that as well. Now, you've kind of intimated that you've had a background in education, and I know that Raymond, by training, you're a teacher by training. Peter is. We'll get into Peter a little bit later because he's not a teacher by training, a traditional teacher by training, a different sort of teacher. Correct. Correct. Fantastic. But uh, so, so Raywin, in your regular role now, what does that entail for you? What does it look like? Yeah, so I'm mostly tutoring one-on-one with um, international students. Um, if you saw the project, um, the two guys on the um, picture, the ones that I work with, um, I'm tutoring them with their academic English and helping them with their study. Um, yeah, so there they are. Yeah. Robert and Philip, um, they're from Vanuatu. So um, some of their study they're doing here in Australia, we have intensives um, that they come to, but also um, they're doing some of it online from Vanuatu. So I, I regularly meet with them via Zoom and um, discuss assignments and, yeah. So, so over the past years we've had a number of students like that from a variety of different countries... Why would they be doing that sort of uh, academic English? I mean, that doesn't sound that sort of exciting thing to do if you're in Vanuatu. Yeah, so they're um, involved in our training with SILA. We um, do training in language development, Bible translation, literacy education, and, um, yeah, so helping them to work in in their country, um, involved in, um, yeah... It might be translation or scripture engagement. Um, yeah, Robert um, the, um, is a scripture engagement intern with SIL in Vanuatu. So he, um, yeah, is learning about and working with local communities in helping them to um, access scripture. He's doing lots of scripture recordings. And, um, yeah, so his training with us is... is giving him extra resources and understanding about, um, yeah, all the, the different work. So your role in some ways is kind of planting the seeds with locals that will, will have a massive impact in their own communities. Yeah, that's right. And helping the, our training is helping them to probably work on not just in within one community but with a, a range of communities. Yeah, yeah. so oh, just one more. Um, um, one of the guys from Papua New Guinea, he was um, one of my first students. He's now a translation consultant. So he travels around Papua New Guinea and works with different language communities, helping them to um, uh, yeah, consult with their Bible translation programs. That must be fantastic to see a local being involved in that and directly kind of hands-on. Uh, when, when I hear that, it, it sounds to me like it must be quite uh, personally rewarding for you to be involved in that. Is, that. is that part of your experience? Yeah, definitely. And um, I, I like the one-on-one work that I do. Um, so it's not a lot of upfront classroom teaching, but tutoring in it, and that becomes a personal relationship as well yeah. as we share life together and pray and, yeah, talk about our journeys. Um, yeah, I find it very rewarding. You, you mentioned uh, the guys from, from PNG before. Does it kind of um, sort of blow your mind a little bit when you think about investing in one person and then they're going to a whole variety of different communities with different languages um, and what the kind of the ripple effect of that is? Yeah, yeah, it is, it's exciting. Um, I guess originally we were working in Papua New Guinea and then when we came back we didn't know what we were going to be involved in and it has been, um, yeah, really encouraging to see how God's used our previous experience in Papua New Guinea to relate to these um, students coming but then also 
yeah, my training and experience um, in teaching and being able to, to be involved in that way. Yeah, it's a really exciting thing. Uh, and Pete, you're, you're not a teacher by training. What are you kind of by training? Uh, my training is in fine arts. Um, after year 12, I did a BA in fine arts with a major in painting. And that's been a real passion and love, I guess, uh, that God's planted, yeah, there for a long time. It's, a, it's actually really exciting to have someone who's uh, creative, you know, like um, sometimes in churches we have a lot of us who are from teachers' background or from things like that. And to have actually an artistic type person is actually, a, I think, a really exciting thing to have. Because uh, art, art's obviously communication in a different sort of way, isn't it? Yeah, it's a very powerful, uh, across cultures, um, most cultures will have, yeah, um, forms of communication that are not just oral, not just written, um, but creative forms of communication that really speak very powerfully to people's hearts. Mm. So, so how is that then being utilised in your role? Uh, so my role with SILA is one of uh, advocacy for local cultures and local arts um, in a variety of communities and um, in training, uh, helping, helping folks to really think through how they can um, find local arts in communities, so working cross-culturally, finding who the artists are, who the local, what the local arts and the local culture are, uh, looking to work with communities so they can express uh, the scriptures, uh, faith and worship in culturally relevant ways that really, yeah, speak to their hearts. Okay, so that, that sounds kind of complicated for a barbarian like myself. Um, what does that mean? You know what I mean? Like, um, you're not so much involved with PNG at the moment. You do some general stuff, but also you're involved with Indigenous Australians. Uh, what does that mean? Okay, so on the ground, um, I'm doing, uh, helping to run workshops uh, with uh, Indigenous Australians, um, usually about once a year. And uh, in uh, Alice Springs and north of Alice Springs. And that's really sitting down with, uh, with local people and listening to them, hearing their stories, but also working through uh, scripture passages and figuring out, helping them to figure out how they can express uh, those passages, talk about those passages, uh, but actually through painting. Uh, through painting using their own local, um, local ways of expressing it. Uh, and so that's, yeah, and then allowing them to share that with the communities and really just seeing God at work through, yeah, through the arts. So, so I'm a 21st century Australian. I'm very enlightened and all that sort of stuff. I've got a couple of dot paintings. Is that the sort of stuff you mean? <laughs> There's about 270 living languages in Australia. 270? About Wait a sec. There's only one lot of dots that I have. Yeah. How does that work? How does 270 so, work? Um, a lot of indigenous languages, and many of them have what look to be similar art forms, uh, but very, very different um, across across Australia. So uh, the dots are one, um, yeah, one form of painting and uh, have many meanings, yeah. yeah. So could you share with us maybe over this past uh, year what that's meant for you in terms of being involved with or maybe um, kind of uh, like a, an actual individual sort of events that's happened as part of that? Um, in terms of working with Australian Indigenous people, um, I had the privilege of being up in Alice Springs in April um, and working with, uh, in conjunction with Alice Springs Baptist Church and with SILA and uh, three different language communities uh, in, in the area. And uh, we had about 15 to 16 different artists come over the course of the week and um, yeah, we were looking um, at a passage in Mark uh, where the paralytic was lowered through through the roof. I think some of us are fairly familiar with them. And really examining what forgiveness is and unpacking what 
what that means. What is, what is God's forgiveness of us and how does that play out in our general life and in community? And you may recall that Alice Springs was in a, a SNAP youth uh, curfew in the CBD during that time. And so it was a very timely uh, time to be sitting down with, with local artists, with local, local community members, um, thinking through what that means. And they produced amazing paintings which they took back to their communities. So, so that method of communication is obviously not the traditional, what we think of a normative teaching type thing, but it actually communicates and teaches in very profound ways, doesn't it? Um, and Pete, I want to ask you this question. Um, it's a year ago since we had a, a national vote on a referendum. Um, your experience in Indigenous communities, how, how has it been responses and stuff? I know this is kind of a little bit different from it, but I thought it would be uh, provocative to ask you about that. <laughs> um, yeah, we... My, my involvement this year, uh, post-referendum, um, we didn't really talk about it a whole lot. It wasn't really a topic of conversation um, in the workshop. Um, I think it's, a, it's something I think a lot of communities are still trying to come to terms with um, and figuring out where to from here. Um, I know from, yeah, from what I've, I've read with the, uh, the recent elections in Northern Territory, there was a record low number of Indigenous uh, voting and turnout. And I think that was in response in many ways to that and a bit of a, just a real questioning is, are we being listened to? Um, and so I think it's a very complicated issue, very complicated, lots of different contexts across Australia. Mm. Um, and there is a variety of, of responses from, okay, we need to look at how, how else we can be listened to, um, to I think some, some have really despaired. Um, yeah, so it is complex. So, so you've been involved both in kind of central areas like Alice Springs, but also smaller communities. Um, smaller communities with a couple hundred people in those kind of communities. Have you seen any difference in those areas in the way in which life is working out? Um, I haven't been back to those small communities um, since uh, the referendum, so it's, yeah, I can't really speak uh, to that. Um, but it's... I think a realisation there's a long way to go before there's um, real reconciliation. Okay. Um, Raywin, I, I want to um, jump back to you. One of the things that um, when we often talk to people in your space is we're asking what you do rather than who you are. Um, I wonder if you might be able to share with us something in which you've either learnt or been challenged about spiritually or personally in your faith journey over this past year. Yeah, um, I've been um, doing some reading and our, through our um, um, God-focused times that we have at work, um, a focus on um, God's love and understanding God's love. I guess I've been a Christian since I was six and in a Christian family and sort of always known God is love, God loves you, trust God. And it's sort of been a, a bit of a mantra, but um, in this yeah past year or so, just trying to to go deeper with that. What what does it mean that God loves me, and how can I um, yeah have have a deeper experience and knowledge of God's love, and how does that impact my life? Yeah, so that's an area I'm working on. Yeah, was there something? Something specific that you actually feel like has actually grabbed your heart or do you feel like you're still in the midst of that journey? Yeah, I think I'm, I'm still in that journey, yeah. So I can I ask you so about that next year? Yeah, maybe. Okay. <laughs> Pete, in a similar way, um, I, I find when I talk to you guys that parts of your worlds must be challenging. Is there something that has provoked you over this past year in terms of your faith journey that you'd like to share with us? 
I think that's the question that I had prearranged. <laughs> I think, yeah, for me as an artist and as a Christian, I think it's... It's, it's going to be a continuing journey of looking at how does, how do you mesh the two um, in, in a culture that's very compartmentalising, but it's, it's not, they're not compartmentalised, they're all kind of one together for me. Mm -hmm. um, and what does that look like? in when I'm working in an arts community that is not necessarily going to be understanding of, of my faith. So, so yeah. I'm, going to, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to drill down into this. Um, this is not on the paper. So... Uh, <laughs> Great. Now, now, I know, Pete, that you are... I know that you are involved with some local artistic collectives in, in Melbourne, all right? And as you said, ten, probably tend not to be a Christian-centred type area. Can you describe kind of what that vibe is like? Because, you know, the average person here, you know, we work in places that aren't filled with Christians and stuff like that. So what's, what's that like? Um, hard for me to kind of describe because it kind of feels normal for me. Yeah. <laughs> um, but... I'm always, you know, rubbing shoulders uh, during the week with artists, uh, curators, uh, gallerists, um, sometimes at openings, um, um, and building a network of artist friends um, who, by and large, don't know don't know the Lord at all, um, and it's a very yeah very different world in. Fitzroy and Footscray and Collingwood um, to to out here, um, and it's um, a lot of a lot of very needy people and a lot of a lot of amazing amazing people who uh, are making incredible art. Um, yeah. Mm. And do you find that is there some points of connection in? Uh, the longing of people's hearts and in their spiritual desire, even though there's no connection with Christianity? I think there is. Um, and it's about... Yeah, I think there is. And it's a very slow journey of relationship building and getting to know... Yeah, getting to know each other and... Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I suppose there's some things which, in a sense, make us all human. Uh, whether we're... Uh, a teacher, whether we're from a Pacific Island or from Central Australia or an artist and stuff like that, that makes us human, which unites us. Uh, is there anything that, that you would like to leave us today that uh, might encourage us in, in our sense of our desire to connect people with Jesus in our own lives in various places? For you or Raywin, I know that, you know, Raywin, you put down your microphone, I know that's a safe spot. Is there something that you want to leave us with today? Um, I think listen to your passions that I think God has put in your heart and who, who it seems like you're naturally drawn to connect with, um, either at work or um, in whatever your, your, your circles are, um, who do you naturally connect with outside of your connect group or outside of church, um, yeah, and just listening to, I guess, listening to that still small voice of God in amongst the busyness. Fantastic. Yeah. Thanks, mate. I'm going to ask, we're going to pray for the two of you, but I'm not going to pray for you up here. I'm going to send you out into the masses, all right? So I'm going to send you out. And so what I'm going to ask Pete and Raymond to do is to go and stand in one of the aisles. They won't do it together. What God has joined together, we will separate. Um, but so, Ray, when if you want to go down the left-hand side or if people want to go down the right-hand side, and if I can ask actually people to come and stand um, uh, beside them, if you know them, you might want to come beside them and place your hand on them or something like that. Could I ask you guys to, to do that? Thank you so much. Could you give them a round of applause? Because um, particularly, Ray, when... Uh,
She doesn't love jumping up in front of people. So could I ask some people to gather around them? That would be fantastic. So to do that, you need to stand up. That's my hint.